Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest CPS In Conversation With. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Tim Harford, uh, who is one of the leading um, economic uh, popu popularizers of economics in, in the country. He's, a, he's an author of uh, multiple incredibly good books, many of which uh, you'll find on my shelves, uh, just out of shot. Um, he is a, a distinguished public speaker. He is the host of the More or Less on Radio 4. He is a brilliant Financial Times columnist, and he was recently rewarded an OBE for uh, his contribution to improving our economic understanding. So hopefully he will improve everyone's economic understanding uh, during during this, this talk. Uh, the format of this will be very simple. Um, roughly half 20 minutes half an hour of conversation between tim and i and then we'll open it up to questions if you have questions please ask them via the q a in zoom or if you're watching on youtube or twitter or facebook then please um ask the questions in the comments box and our crack team should be able to to, to feed them in um so tim first of all thank you very much for, for joining us um, it's my pleasure thank you robert it's really kind of you to to have me you know speak to uh speak to loyal members, followers of the CPS. It's very kind of you. And um, well, let's start by saying, obviously, your, your, the, the, your, your latest book, um, which um, we'll be talking about quite a bit, I think is called How to Make the World Add Up. And it's about the power and importance of, of statistics. And it's fair to say the last year, in a way you could never have imagined when you were writing this book, you, you say at the very start of it that you know, you're writing this in the, in, in the sort of opening, you're, you're, right, you're, you're finishing the book just as the pandemic kicks into, kicks into gear. And we have all become absolute experts in the use of statistics or and the abuse of statistics in fact in the last year you know um the r rate has 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 been elevated from an obscure statistical fact to the governing principle of of national policy um you know the um the, the, the nerd in me robert has to point out that it's the r number not the r rate because it's it's, it's not a rate over time sorry <laughs> it is you're absolutely what, right and this is where we get the experts in uh, you know? this is what you have me for to just you know, pick away and undermine your I'm, confidence I'm, I'm just i'm just a journalist who, who i i just I, I don't understand anything i talk about i just have the policy guys they explain it all to me and i yeah i just recycle uh, what i <laughs> as best i understand it. but yeah but basically i mean your statistics and numbers have become basically the organizing principle of, of national life i mean it, it must have been a sort of strange experience for you it, it was it was a strange experience there there was um it was a heck of a way to be proved right about something. Uh, it gives me no satisfaction. The, 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 the basic argument of how to make the world add up was always supposed to be, look, you think about these numbers as being just weapons in political arguments, that numbers are just things you put on the side of a bus in order to get people to vote for you. And, uh, and actually, they're much more important than that. Look, numbers are, numbers are, are life or death matters. Num numbers are, they're like radar. They show us the, 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 the scope of what's coming in and show us where to invest our resources and, and incoming threats that we need to deal with. And yes, as you, as you say, the, the book was just about to be finished when the first lockdown uh, struck us. I and mean, I think with this, it's the first anniversary today. And I think I was supposed to be submitting my book to my publishers by the end of March. And, uh, I said, I might need a few more, few more weeks, but actually it wasn't very difficult to rewrite the book to reflect coronavirus, because in fact, coronavirus was just, this was just the best possible example, the most horrible possible example of what I was talking about, that this isn't just about politics. This isn't just about making arguments. It's about understanding the world. Um, there was a, a brief moment, this is gonna sound strange because I think like a lot of people, I found that the, the the arrival of the of the virus quite traumatizing and very worrying and, and I lost a, a good friend very early on. Um, but there was something refreshing as well about presenting more or less at a moment where people just wanted to know what was going on. And there was none of this kind of both sidesism, there was none of this kind of this polarization. Um, there were people just wanted to understand what was going on and we were trying to understand what was going on and that was the vision that i had for statistics this is how people should think about statistics they're imperfect they, they're incomplete they're flawed but they are a really important way of trying to understand the world and we we dismiss them at our, at our peril and, and of course the other um interesting thing as well as being the anniversary of lockdown today it's um, it's two days since the since the census um, and one of the one of the more interesting 
bits of, well if you're a policy nerd like me one of the more interesting bits of your book is when you basically try to quantify the economic value of the office for national statistics or it's yeah. or it's equivalent and of the census yes and we've got we've got no idea what the economic value of the the ons is uh, or the economic value of the census but but pe people have tried and uh, actually the, the effort in the uk if i remember ended up getting really hand wavy and saying, well, there's all this stuff that's obviously super important and we've got no idea how valuable it is. But even the very narrow uh, sort of cluster of things that, that they were willing to quantify was, was worth considerably more than the cost of the census. And this is a point I think that some people just instinctively grasp and some people resist. Uh, it is worth spending money trying to, trying to get the data, trying to understand what's going on. And we make choices about where to spend our money and where to spend our time. And those choices are often not very thoughtful. Uh, just to give you a couple of quick examples, one of my favorites comes from Will Moy, the director of Full Fact. It's a terrific fact-checking organization. Will points out that we know more about people's golfing habits than we know about the victims of sexual assault. Uh, and this is something that's become all too topical in the last couple of weeks. Uh, why do we know more about golf than the victims of sexual assault? Well, because the victims of crime survey is smaller than the sporting participation surveys. Fewer participants, less money spent on it. And that wasn't because anybody ever said, you know, we really want to understand sport and we really want to understand crime, but it's more important to understand sport. No one ever made that decision. There was an existing crime survey and then the London Olympics came along and People said it was really important to understand the legacy of the London Olympics, so we're going to fund this big new survey of sporting participation. Um, why does it matter that, the, that the, the survey is bigger? Well, it's bigger, it gives you more resolution uh, to identify local trends, for example, and gives you more visibility of, of unusual uh, activities. Um, so we made this choice, but I don't think we made this choice in a thoughtful way. Um, we could be more thoughtful about this. So there are occasionally horizon scanning projects, Full Fact was involved in one of them a few years ago, where you just say, okay, look, we're gonna get counterterrorism experts, we're gonna get epidemiologists, we're going to get um, uh, information security experts, we're going to get uh, people who understand uh, drug abuse, we're gonna get, we'll just get a whole bunch of people together in the room and we'll, have a conversation about the data that they got and the data that they want that they don't have uh, about the incoming threats that we might want to start to measure and then with that sort of horizon scanning exercise completed you can start saying maybe we should be spending more money for example just for example doing a uh, a survey of the british population where we take their blood and we try and figure out whether they've got any infections which we now do but we didn't do it a year ago, and maybe we should have done. It's expensive, but possibly it's worthwhile, and possibly it's a thing that we should continue to do. In, in my own specialist area on that, um, we have absolutely, like, we, we think that a third, a quarter, something like that of the population are wandering around with liver disease, and we have absolutely no idea who they are yeah. and where they are. You know, we think it's probably people in, 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 a, in a London who tend to eat, like, fast food and fried chicken, but we don't, like, yeah. no one's actually gone out and tested you know, on a, on, a mass, on, a, on a mass population scale. You just have to wait until they turn up in hospital 20 years later. Yeah, absolutely. We don't know how many people in the country uh, receive social care. Um, local authorities know the people they are paying for, uh, for social care for, but the Department for Health and Social Care didn't collate that data, and we don't know who's paying privately uh, for, for care in their homes. So, um, you know, this turns out to be super important when you're in a global pandemic and the people in care homes and otherwise receiving social care are, are highly vulnerable. We don't know who works in the social care sector. We don't know how many households receive um, parcels from food banks. We, know, we now know, we didn't know this a few years ago, but we now know or have a good sight of how many parcels food banks give out, but we don't know whether they're giving out parcels again and again to the same families or whether it's a, it's a different spread. Um, these are things that we could figure out. They're not impossible to know. It's a question of priorities that we put on them and the resources we invest. But against that, you also want another sort of convincing strand of your book is, is about big data, where you take 
a series of eye-catching studies, like the idea that Google searches can predict flu, uh, for example. Um, in, in fact, yeah, studies that I, I probably both you and I have have, have ha ha merrily cited uh, for for about, for about a decade, and uh, and show that actually they they all tend to they they tend to fall apart. That like more often than not, you know, our understanding of big data is is limited by the data sets available, or and is making and is at root making some pretty obvious correlations that you or I could make. Like you know, if you take folic acid supplements, you're probably you know yeah you're it's quite likely you're pregnant yes i mean yes a lot of we, we tend to view big data and the algorithms that run on big data we tend to view them as rather magic uh and this is very famous example published in the new york times magazine nearly a decade ago now with charles duhigg about this man who complained to target it's a department store in the u.s that they were mailing uh, various maternity related offers to his teenage daughter and um, it, it later turned out that Target had correctly identified that his teenage daughter was pregnant, even though he didn't know that. Um, and everyone was like, oh, wow, the algorithm is so amazing and all, all seeing it. My, one of my, there were several points to make about this, but the point I wanted to underline was if you could see what someone was shopping for and you saw that they were buying uh, pregnancy testing kits, for example, folic acid, well, it might not be too difficult to guess their status. It's not, it's not some magic. Um, but because we imbue these algorithms with, I think, with too much respect, but we fear them too much. Those people who don't like algorithms, I think, think they're more powerful than they are. And we respect them too much. Governments who you know, bring algorithms in to solve our problems, I think, rate them too highly. Um, you only have to think about last, uh, last summer's algo shambles, where you know, my daughter was among many assigned GCSE results by an algorithm. And we would just we think, if you step back and think about it for a moment. You go, so you're telling me that an algorithm can predict what results I would get on an exam that I never sat. It's on, on the basis of what? It's impossible. It's impossible. And, well, yeah, and, and we, should, we should know this, yeah. Or my favorite example recently, which is that um, it, when the pandemic started, it, um, it was reported that Spain had an incredibly dis disturbingly high um, child mortality rate uh, from COVID. And there was a lot of um, work that went into working out what it was. And it turns out that the database they were using uh, didn't have a third digit. So people who were 101, 102, 103 were being counted as one, two and three year olds yeah. and were, whenever they got COVID were dying of COVID. It's, it's, it's a fantastic example or pretty grim example but but really illustrative but one of the one of the points i make in the book is that we um are perfectly happy to use big data sets perfectly happy to have algorithms help us make decisions but we just need proper oversight uh proper evaluation of these things um i, 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 did, I, I did i did like yeah. the test -based solution that you refer to where um when someone someone noticed that um, uh you know would you like to order condoms again on tesco <laughs> And uh, because their husband would be cheating on them. Um, yes. and, uh, and Tesco just went, oh, it's a computer error. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's, oh, it's, it's a terrific one. That, yes, I mean, that's from, um, uh, I, think I, I think I cite that, that Hannah Fry told me this. So Hannah Fry's book, Hello World, is a particularly good guide to, to algorithms. Uh, and there are, there are some good books out there. So Hello World is one, um, Weapons of Math Destruction is one, uh, Big Data is one. Um, what I add in the, the chapter in, the, in uh, How to Make the World Add Up, what I think I add, which I've not, is a, not a point I've seen made, made elsewhere, is the, the standards of uh, data sharing, evaluation, uh, collaboration, replication that we have in this field remind me of alchemy in the 1600s, where uh, you had alchemy, you had the, the top people, Isaac Newton was an alchemist. You had the experimental method. You know, you said, you're cutting edge methods for trying to discover what's true and what's not. And alchemy made no progress because you did not have um, the, the, the habit, the standard, the expectation of collaboration, of public, publishing your data, uh, of performing experiments in public, of having other people try to repeat it and see whether they got the same results. Th this, these are the standards, the, the you know, the practices of science, not of alchemy. And we seem to have gone back to the alchemical way of doing things when it comes to big data. And for the same reason, like why would, why would an alchemist not explain the progress he was making turning lead into gold? 
uh, the answer is because if he figures out how to turn lead into gold, he doesn't want anybody to know how he does it. And it's exactly the same reason that Facebook and Google and all these, uh, the people making the recidivism alchemy, uh, algorithms, they don't want us to know how they do that stuff either. Um, but it, it's not good enough because you can have a really um, surprisingly good algorithm can have pernicious effects. And you can have a surprisingly bad algorithm can have quite good effects. Um, there's, a, there's an example I give in the book of, uh, of an algorithm, David Spiegelholz told me this example, of an algorithm which helps doctors diagnose lower, non-specific lower abdominal pain. This is an early 1980s algorithm. It's terrible. It's on a Commodore 64 in the corner of the office, and it's just awful. And in a randomized trial, it turns out doctors do a better job when they've got this computer in the corner of their room because the, the, the stupid prompt that the computer is giving them and the time they're having to take to think it through and, and answer is making them better doctors. So even though the algorithm is useless, it turns out using the algorithm turns out to produce better results. You need the oversight, you need the testing. And at the moment, we don't have nearly enough of that. And so turning sort of more towards the, 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 the pandemic itself, so one of the themes of, of your book um, is is about the sort of abuse of, of statistics. Um, so you, you give this, this wonderful example of um, Florence Nightingale, who um, who, as you say, sort of ends up raising life expectancy in the UK by about twenty years because she is able to show using statistics that um, actually things like washing hands and having clean water do um, are, are rather more important when you're fighting a military campaign and then you know running a country uh, than who, who's actually getting shot on the battlefield. Um, and and you actually and there's a really interesting thing you, you show <laughs> about how she, she she presents her data in the in, a, in an actually kind of quite biased way to to make make it clear that that everyone else will reach the same conclusion she does but equally you you have um in a sort of in the 1950s um when they're just starting to cotton on that there was a link to smoking you have people go, going up in in um in front of congress and telling them you know extreme in extremely scientific terms that um, actually that you know the chance of you getting cancer if you smoke it's, it's just it's a it's a false correlation it's just that yeah. you know loads of people smoke and loads of people get cancer and you know there's not there's not nothing to to, to see here and um, how do you think statistics have have survived the the pandemic um, so that's a very good question. Uh, on Florence Nightingale, by the way, I, I w would be remiss of me not to direct people to the recent episode of my podcast, Cautionary Tales, in which, in well, yet, which yet, 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 another, yet another product that I forgot to I forgot to mention. You yeah, are. well, I'm I'm a man I'm of many parts. What can I say? I just, I, but this particular project, uh, Helena Bottom Carter plays Florence Nightingale, so I'm quite proud of it and quite excited about it. And we go into some detail as to you know, what she was doing and how she was doing it and whether she crossed the line in terms of the presentation of her, of her data. So the cautionary tales is, is worth checking out. Um, how, ha how has statistics weathered the pandemic? Um, well, of course, it's a mixed bag. I think fundamentally, people have realized that this stuff matters, that the, you, there are things that you can only see using robust statistical methods. And, and the things that you can see really count. So try to estimate our numbers, try to figure out what the infection fatality rate is. Doing something as simple as tracking how many doses of vaccine have been administered and then getting you know, more detailed and saying, well, hang on, who have they been administered to? What kind of vaccine has been administered? Are there any areas that are fall falling behind? Um, how's the comparison of men and women? What about different ethnic groups? How, how's that all going? And if, if say, for example, um, you see higher rates of vaccination in, in whites in the Southwest, well, why is that? Is that because the systems are better? Is that because there's, there's more demand? What's going on? So people understand how important this is. Uh, and that's really the central thesis of, of the book, above all else, is to remind people how important the statistics are and to say it's not as hard as you might think interpreting them. Uh, where, where I'm more discouraged is just observing how quickly certain things have been polarized that should not be polarized. Uh, how quickly certain, you, you might call them conflict entrepreneurs have jumped in and said, okay, well, we can grab hold of these numbers and we can spin our own story. There's a political argument to be made. We wanna make it. We want to try to discredit the experts if we can. 
Uh, and yeah, you know, it didn't happen for about three months, but it, it, it didn't take long, it didn't take long. And that's, anything can be polarized, it turns out, but it doesn't make us smarter when, when it is. And, and one of the things you, you, you talk about is how the sort of one of the, I mean, there's, there's lots of, there's, you, you have your sort of 10 commandments through the book, but what quite a lot of them come back to is, is, is we let our feelings and our pride get in the way of, of, you know, of, of, of an analysis. You, I mean, you're talking about Philip Tetlock, who obviously found that the, the best forecasters were those who were able to, you know, update their, you know, take their own prejudices out of, out of the equation and, and, you know, have the humility to admit they've been wrong and various other various other techniques. Whereas, yeah. you, you, you know, what you're describing is, is effectively using, trying to use people using statistics as scaffolding for their existing preconceptions, as opposed to arguing from the evidence. I, I think that's right. So to, to give you an example of that, and you're right, the, the, a lot of the book is about trying to be wiser about our own biases and filters, as well as trying to be wiser about the data themselves. But a really interesting example, quite early on in the pandemic, this idea arose that um, maybe lots and lots of people had had this disease already and it was asymptomatic. And therefore maybe we were already on the brink of herd immunity. This is back in April. And there was a group at Oxford who had produced this, this model exploring this idea. The most famous epidemiologist on that team was Sunetra Gupta. And I, I interviewed her, uh, I, I'd never, I mean, she's now, very high profile as a, as a result of this, but no one had ever heard of her at the time. Certainly I'd never heard of her. And she, she said, she explained, look, you know, there's, there's no way to tell really, given that all we can really measure is deaths at the moment. We, we don't have a good measure of cases because we don't have enough tests. All we can really measure is deaths. We don't know whether that's consistent with a small number of people have got it and it's very dangerous or almost everybody's got it and it's not very dangerous at all. And I said, well, that's very interesting. So what are we going to do about that? And she said, well, I'm working on um, antibody tests, blood tests that will reveal whether people have got it and other people are also working on this. And so hopefully very soon we'll know the answer to that question. And it turns out very soon we did know the answer to that question. And it was actually, it is fairly dangerous. There's about a 1% fatality rate. Uh, it isn't true that most people had had it by April, sadly. Um, April 2020 was was not kind of the end of the pandemic. We know all this now. What I find striking is that there was a certain hardcore of people who, when the blood test came in and showed, well, it looks like nobody, you know, not many people have developed antibody, antibodies to this virus. Looks like it's not very widespread. Certain people were like, oh no, no, there's there were different kinds of antibodies. It's, you know, people have got T cell immunity, people have got this, people have got that. And you could see certain people working very, very hard to maintain um, a hypothesis, even as the data came in to disconfirm it. Nothing wrong with the hypothesis in April, but by June, it was starting to look ridiculous. And then you, you, you would also see, so, sorry, you'd also see people who would have a view that I, I regard as perfectly reasonable. I don't agree with it, but perfectly reasonable view, which is, um, you know, the lockdowns have done more harm than good. Um, and, you know, we should just have taken it on the chin and not had lockdowns. I, I think you can make that argument. Um, but the argument tended to be made with very, very strange takes on the data, like the infection fatality rate's really one in a thousand. You, you look at you like, how, how can the infection fatality rate be one in a thousand? If it's one in a thousand, what, 125,000, depending on how you measure it, 145,000 people have died. Um, can't, you know, there aren't 145 million people in the country. Can't be that everyone's had it twice. Um, so it's when you see people reaching for dodgy science because they want to argue for a particular conclusion rather than doing how it should work, which is, here's, here's my conclusion. Um, here's the case I want to make. Uh, let's look at the science and, and you know, evaluate the best possible science and use the best possible evidence in support of my conclusion rather than twisting the evidence to support my conclusion. Sorry, it's a long old rant, but no. it's kind of very frustrating, some of this. No, fair, but I mean, you know, there's lots of, um, you know, I mean, just looking at my, my notes uh, from the book, you know, you say that you know, at, at the um, 2016 election in the US, 13% of Donald Trump's voters trusted the economic, trusted the employment statistics, yeah. and 86% of Clinton's uh, supporters trusted the employment statistics, largely because Trump was there telling people that the real employment rate, unemployment rate in the country was it was 35% or something else that he, you know, which, which, you know, you can make an argument that the employment, unemployment rate is higher 
if you like take the economically inactive population as opposed to just the unemployment rate but he was just he was he was not really doing that he was just doing it's there's, there's often something interesting going on behind that sort of misinformation but I mean, it's certainly true that um just looking at the official unemployment rate does not capture the full scope of um all of the people who might ideally want a job uh and feel in one way or another excluded from the labor market um, there are certainly broader ways to measure the unemployment rate or to measure um, jo- you know, joblessness. Um, but Trump wasn't making that argument, Trump, because that, you know, that's kind of complicated and doesn't, doesn't win votes. The argument he wanted to make is the system's rigged, they're lying to you, and don't trust, don't trust them, trust me. That's a different message and, and a very destructive message. Yeah. So um, please, um, before we get on to questions, and please do um, uh, uh, ask us, uh, put them in the Q&A um, if you can, otherwise I'll just keep vamping. Um, but there's, there's one central charge I want to make against this book, which I think could be applied to pretty much everything that, that I write about, certainly, um, as, as well, which is that, is there not a case that, you know, rational, statistics-driven, nice you know, intelligent people who actually read policy reports and actually look at statistics and actually run them. We're, we're, we're pissing in the wind, right? The, you know, the, the reality of life is, is that, you know, the, the, there's a tsunami of fake news and, you know, um, um, uh, motivated reasoning and all the rest of it. And, you know, and writing a book saying, t- trying to teach people how to use statistics, statistics better, like, the, you know, that, you know, <laughs> there, there, there is a, you 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 are you are you are rallying you rallying a flag while the while the sort of the the sort of the, the forces of Mordor are are swarming towards you. Well, I, I know what you mean, uh, and I reminded is it, is it was it Peter Cook who talked about the, the wonderful work satire did to to defeat the the rise of the Nazis and and defend Weimar Germany. Oh yeah, it sometimes it feels a little bit like that, but uh, it's actually, I don't think it's as hard as we sometimes make out. Um, Most people don't want to be wrong. Um, Most people uh, do care about the truth. Uh, You know, we just find it difficult. And it turns out that telling the difference between truth and lies isn't necessarily as difficult as we sometimes make out. Uh, It's not super technical very often. It often requires just taking a deep breath, noticing you're having an emotional reaction, going another click, asking a couple more questions. Um, This stuff's not so hard. Uh, There's a wonderful study by um, Penny Cook and Rand, two psychologists. They they just look at people who um, are perfectly happy to share outrageous misinformation, like uh, 500 migrant uh, caravanners have been arrested at the Mexican border wearing suicide vests. And so if you're sort of a, kind of Trump diehard supporter. That's the kind of thing that feels like it should be true. Um, And so the people in their study were very happy to retweet that or to to share that. When they just said, um, do you think that's true? People would go, well, no, I don't think it is actually. I mean, why would you you have 500 people with suicide vests at the Mexican border? What are you gonna do with a suicide vest at the Mexican border? It doesn't make any sense. Who, Who would cross Guatemala with a suicide vest? I mean. So people, they would see it's not true. And then, and that was enough. That was enough. People would be like, oh, I'm not going to share that. So just that brief moment of, are you, hang on, are you sure? People were happy to go, oh, you know, actually, yeah, that's not true. And I don't want to share things that are not true. So it's that slowing people down for a second, getting people to reflect for a second that makes a big difference. Yes, and the, the defense I would make of, of my book versus a lot of other books about statistics. There are lots of great books about statistics out there, but most of the ones, certainly the ones written before how to make the world add up, they're, they're very much technical books. Like here's how to think about correlation and causation. Here are the, here are the technical ways in which a, a number can lead you astray. And what I'm saying is, okay, first of all, make sure you don't lead yourself astray be psychologically aware, try to be a little bit wiser about yourself. Once you've done that, then let's talk about the numbers. And of course, you know, it's a constant battle, both for me and for you and for anybody else to overcome our own filters, our own limitations. Uh, No one's ever going to be perfect at it, but there are some simple things that you can do to to catch yourself and, and prevent some of the most egregious errors. 
So I'm, I'm just I mean, I'm just remembering a, a time a couple of years back when um, I think it was a John, John McDonald went on the Today program and said that um, th like the profits made by British companies were, were greater than all of the money that they were paying their workers put together. Um, a, a statistic yeah. which a statistic which he'd reached by assuming that anything which wasn't salary was profit. Um, and yes. I, I, and if you want one of your researchers on more or less contacted me because you were interested in doing something on it and then just ended up saying look we can't do anything on this it's just it's just so wrong <laughs> there's like this there's no story here there's no kind of there's no, uh, there's no fun little five minute thing we can do it's just like... uh, yes I, i've forgotten that but it's 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 a really interesting illustration of um i mean mcdonald is not an idiot and and i suspect that he wasn't deliberately lying either it just felt right to him it felt right uh, just like these Trump supporters, it felt right that there should be migrants with suicide vests at the border. Uh, and there, there are all sorts of things that just feel right to us. And when they feel right, we don't question them. My own example, this is from a few years ago. Um, I remember retweeting something showing increasing support for same-sex marriage in the US. And I have very strong views about it. I'm very much in favor. I think it's an important human freedom that we should all have. And I thought, oh, this is great. Finally, the US is on the right, right side of history. They just retweeted it to whatever, however many tens of thousands of followers I had at the time. And uh, the first response from somebody was, have you looked at the axes on that graph, Tim? To which the answer was, no, I didn't look at the axes because I had the feels and I, this just felt good and right and I wanted to share it and I didn't look. And that's... You no, know, can affect me, can affect Trump supporters, can affect John McDonald, can affect anybody. Um, but it affects us less if we slow down. That's right. Okay, um, we've got a, a load of questions coming in. So, um, uh, which actually speak to these, um, I mean, lots of really good questions. Um, so, um, um, uh, Peter, on, on, on the pandemic, um, Peter Dalton asks, um, do you think the epidemiologists have had too dominant a role in SAGE and, and COVID uh, COVID policy, um, uh, e.g., you know, why why don't economists have uh, have a bigger role to play? I mean, not, this is, he, he's not he's not saying mm -hmm. um, he's not talking about the cost of lockdowns. He's saying that actually, like Nisa and some others have have made better estimates, of, have made just as good estimates as or better estimates than some of the epidemiologists using other uh, techniques. Yes, yeah, so there's always there's always a risk, isn't there? Of, um, of, of we just get outside our our area of expertise very quickly, so. And we're always tempted to have a go. So I think epidemiologists have generally had a pretty good crisis. I think some of the early epidemiological modeling on re really very thin data, very quickly figured out all of the, the essential facts about, um, about the coronavirus in terms of how uh, quickly it spread, uh, how dangerous it was, who was most at risk. They got a lot of the big picture stuff right really early. Where I think epidemiologists did less well is in, in, in situations where you would not expect them to do well. So, for example, um, can people be trusted to obey lockdown rules? If we just ask them nicely, will that be enough? If we uh, give them broad guidelines and say, use your judgment, given these are the guidelines, will that be enough? Uh, do we need to be very specific and talk about two meter rules and the, the, if we go into lockdown too soon people will get bored of it after a few weeks and it was the lo lockdown fatigue now these decisions seem to be made by people who didn't have any expertise in psychology now i don't have any particular expertise in psychology either but when i talked to psychologists they were like this is nonsense none of this makes any sense lockdown fatigue is just made up no one's got any evidence that lockdown fatigue is a thing um and i uh, talked to uh Nick Chater, who's a really interesting psychologist at Warwick Business School, and he said, think about, um, you know, you, you, you've got, you have a baby and, and they need to change their nappy. Like, you don't get nappy fatigue. You've got a dog, you need to change, take your dog for a walk every day. You don't get walk fatigue. You just do it because you have to do it and you do it for as long as you need to do it. And in fact, it becomes a habit and it becomes less effortful. Um, now, I mean, it's not clear that lockdown would be the same as taking your dog for a walk or changing your, your baby's nappy, but it's not obvious that it would not be the same. And when you actually, when the epidemiologists do get involved with that kind of modeling, very quickly you see, well, hang on, if you lock down a week earlier, you not only save, say, half the lives that would be lost in that wave, but you can unlock four weeks, four weeks earlier. So you sort of come out uh, because the decay is, is slower than the spike. 
the, if you prevent the spike, then you can get out much. Earlier. So it's all this sort of stuff that, you know, people very quickly get out of their, um, their zone of competence. Um, I'm not one of these people who believes, oh, basically the economists were just much smarter than the epidemiologists about epidemiology. Uh, I've seen that kind of that sort of claim play out over and over again. Oh, like the sociologists should be the ones doing the economics. The anthropologists should be the ones doing the sociology. It, you know, normally people make very basic mistakes when they, when they get into other people's domain. But what I do think is really important is for different disciplines to work together. Um, you can, as an economist, you can spot certain flaws in the thinking of other disciplines and other disciplines can spot that certain flaws in the discipline of economics, the way that economists think. If you can get those people together in the room, having a productive discussion, you go to do a better job. Um, my impression is that in general, the scientific advice given to the government has been pretty good. And the mistakes that have been made, were, were, there are some exceptions, were mostly not scientific mistakes. They were mistakes of, you know, there were policy mistakes and you know, insufficiently decisive, insufficient resolution, but understandable, certainly in the first wave. So um, I'm going to sort of try and com combine a few questions because quite, quite a lot of questions about the um, about the media um, uh, angle. Um, so, um, so just to explain to everyone, um, Tim is Tim is watching this via via a, via a camera, hence his beaut a really nice camera, hence his be beautifully crystal clear uh, vision, but he can't actually see the questions. Um, so, we, so I'm, which is why I'm reading them all out to, to him. Um, so, um, Anne Cuttermill asks, um, says, um, many uh, journalists says basically, you know, how do we get journalists to be better at uh, at understanding statistics? Um, yep. Someone else uh, felt the scrolling down says, um, um, how much of this is, is fueled by a click hungry media? Um, and but but is the problem the, the media or the people who are, who are doing the doing the clicking? And we had another a question about I mean, how you make uh, true from Gavin Allen about how you make true stats as grabby slash viral as uh, as fake ones. So um, yeah, so it, it, you know, how do you yeah. hit the journalist fault or the public's? How do you improve the quality of journalism? How do you how do you present good stats as as as, as grabbily as bad as bad ones? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of good stuff there. So um, I mean, I think. Journalists are under pressure to do stuff really fast and with the, the maximum of clicks and the minimum of, uh, minimum of effort. Um, that puts all journalists under pressure and makes it hard to do, harder to do a good job. Um, there are some very good statistical journalists out there and they're, do, they're doing great work. And they, it's interesting, they're getting a lot of attention when they get it right. So um, I noticed, I saw recently an, an analysis of the whole kind of, social media, I think particularly Twitter ecosystem, uh, misinformation and information all over the world. And one of the key figures in it was my colleague, John Byrne Murdoch of the Financial Times. Because, mm. and, and no one had ever heard of John Byrne Murdoch, apart, apart from his colleagues who know he's wonderful. No one had ever heard of John Byrne Murdoch a year and a half ago. He just came on Twitter with really, really good, clear data visualizations, made it better every day, explained what he was doing, and when he'd finished setting up a visualization to explain one question, he'd move on to another question and give people answers to, to things that they really wanted to know and give them um, not just answers, but the sense that they could see what was going on themselves, the sense that they could, this invisible threat was, was visible. So, you know, there are rewards to doing great journalism and there's rewards to doing kind of ambush journalism and clickbaity stuff as, as well. Um, can we make uh, solid statistics as as catchy as as nonsense. Um, yes, and John Byrne Murdoch, I think, is an example of that. Um, hopefully, more or less, is an example of that. I mean, we're now in a pretty prime time slot. Um, just after the Today program on on Wednesday mornings, we we get repeated a lot. Um, people are interested. You know, they see why this stuff is important, but there is you're always slightly pushing uphill. And I, let me give you a personal story about something I screwed up last year, and I think it illustrates this point. So I wrote a piece for the FT late August, early September, trying to say, okay, look, first wave's over. It's all super quiet. How frightened should you be? As you go about your daily business, should a 62-year-old friend of mine still be staying indoors? Or can he actually get out and about 
with, with some reasonable confidence. And I went through all of the data and I really worked hard to get all the data right. And at the end of the article, I, you know, I'd said, oh, it's, the risk is about, I think about one in a million every day of catching a fatal case of COVID for this particular person. And I listed some other one in a million events, including dying in a bath. Um, the people really thought that was very interesting. Wow, the risk of COVID is the same as the risk of dying in a bath. Um, and the FT put that dying in a bath thing in the headline, I think, because it was so eye-catching. And then the Sun reported on it, the Mirror reported on it, and the Daily Mail asked me to, to write something. And the moment you get you in the Daily Mail, you're like, hmm, I'm worried. <laughs> and, um, and I was saying to my wife, I'm just not sure about that bath thing. And she said, go and check, go and check. So I'm okay, fine, I'll go and check, and I check, and I check, and I realized, oh yeah, my original source is absolutely, um, you know, no, I've got it, I've got my source. I was like, I don't believe my source either. And then I went deeper and deeper and deeper and eventually found that my source had made a mistake. And it was the risk of dying in the bath in a year, not the risk of dying in a bath if you take a bath. Um, the reason I say all this is I think nothing I've ever done in 20 years of being a journalist got as much media as my incorrect claim that the risk of dying of COVID at that particular moment was the same as the risk of dying in the bath. And the thing is, I got all the maths about COVID right. It was just the, the bath that I got wrong. Why did it get so much coverage? Because it's so eye-catching. It was so surprising. Why was it so eye-catching and so surprising? Because it wasn't true. So, well, that, that, that famous law, isn't there? The, the more eye-catching a statistic, the, the less likely it is to be true. I think, I think it's really important. And of course, I, so I, I, the mail, to their credit, I phoned them minutes before they went to press and they changed it. And they weren't happy, but they, they were like, well, we've got to get it right. You know, and it was annoying because the only reason we ever commissioned the piece was because this bath <laughs> thing. But for, you know, to their credit, they, you know, they, they got it right. They changed it at the last minute. But my corrections, so I corrected the piece in the FT and all of this, the correction's never going to get as much publicity as the mistake. And that's just something I've got to live with. I made a mistake and I hope nobody made a bad decision because of my mistake and suffered for it. I, I, um, I, I've never agonised so much before, before deleting a tweet which was, which was in the process of going viral and was very slightly wrong. And I just, I remember thinking I can, I could probably just get away with leaving this up and just doing a, like a reply correction, but I, it just yeah. wouldn't sit, wouldn't sit right. It was, yeah, uh, but that, that's what you've, that's what you're up against as a journalist. I'm not making any excuses. I made a mistake, but that just tells you there's the, and it's not even any malice. People just want to share stuff that's interesting. And one of the main reasons why something is interesting is because it's wrong. And that's where you're always, what you're always pushing against. So you need to try to make the truth as interesting as something surprising. And, so, and my colleague, John Bird Murdoch does that. And I think other people do that because ultimately the truth does have an advantage. It's that people would rather be right than wrong. They'd rather know the truth. I mean, I still believe that, um, but, it's, but the truth is really as interesting. As something super eye-catching. Got an interesting question from my, my colleague Alex Morton about identity politics, which actually, you know, cuts against quite a lot of the things you're you're, you're saying. Where essentially, the, the the whole concept of like, like the, 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 the distorted and this is structurally, um, you know, some, some sorry, I'm. Um, my internet connection is unstable. Apparently, I got too excited about that. But you know, <laughs> are, you, are, are you worried about that kind of ten, uh, about that tendency? Um, so, so well, you, well you did that. you did just freeze for a second, Robert. So, just say again what, what was the question so the, about identity politics? Uh, identity politics, like in, in some in some sections of it, there's this idea that you know that it effectively you know people are opposed to the whole concept of objective truth mm -hmm. rather than systemic oppression and subjective truth, and it's you mm -hmm. know it's your personal experience which counts, and you know it's you, you know it's not. Um, you know, if the data says something else, then that's because the data is collect corrected by a collected by a corrupt regime. Mm -hmm. kind of. um, so I think it is important to, and there's a whole chapter in the book. Uh, it is important to reflect on how your personal experience and the data match up. So the data, the the information that we get from living our own lives is so much richer and more vivid than anything you could ever get from a spreadsheet. Uh, on the other hand, the you know the statistics can give us a global picture. And I say it's like, it's like the worm's eye view and the bird's eye view. 
which is better? Well, I mean, you know, the worm is up close can see with incredible the bird gets a bigger, you know a broader picture but doesn't get the same you know doesn't get the same high resolution sorry i, just, so I, I was i was trying to screenshot a request a, a speaking request for you for, for later and accidentally stabbed the uh the, the <laughs> rock music button excellent um well whoever sent the speaking request thank you very much um and please do send it on to me robert but the you need both you need to reflect on both and if you're personal experience is contradicting the data, it's worth asking why. Like, what is it about the data that you think is wrong? What is it about my personal experience that might be not wrong, but, but very particular to my own circumstance? Or is in fact, there's, there a way to, to marry both? I, there's an example in the book, the book I give about um, how come London tubes are packed when I'm on them, and yet their overall utilization is, is surprisingly low. And I describe how you can resolve that. So. Yeah, I, I wouldn't dismiss people's personal experience, but the moment at which you say all the data are falsified, all my per my personal experience is the only thing that matters. Um, have you sort of given up on trying to really understand the world as a whole? Um, I don't think many people do actually think that. Uh, and I'm certainly trying to push against it in the book. This whole narrative of lies, damned lies, and statistics um, seems very smart to us. We're cynical. We're not going to be fooled by the numbers. But actually being uh, reflexively dismissive of every claim is just as bad as reflexively accepting every claim. If you think about conspiracy theorists, we obsess about the curious things they believe, like, oh, um, you know, Donald Trump is about to be inaugurated as the true, first true president of the US since 1873, or the world is flat and we, you know, pilots have their GPS systems fiddled with by Bill Gates in order to, all of this kind of nonsense. We focus on the crazy stuff they believe, but actually what you need to ask yourself is, well, what do they, don't, what do they not believe? What do they disbelieve? And the answer is, well, they, they disbelieve the science, they disbelieve the media, they disbelieve politicians, they disbelieve the evidence of their own eyes, disbelieve all kinds of things. And so ra radical disbelief, indiscriminate disbelief, is as dangerous, I think, as indiscriminate belief. And you know, a good grasp of statistics, uh, as well as a good grasp of our own flaws and biases can really help us. Interesting question from Simon Clark. How can we make it easier to be wrong? How can we make it easier to admit to change to, to change your mind? Because one of the the the, the I mean, he doesn't ask about social media, but it's fairly obvious. Like one of the the ways you get a following on social media is just to pick up and actually, as a newspaper columnist, is to pick a position and absolutely uh, absolutely hammer us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, that can work. At the same time. Uh, generally, when I've written pieces that have said, oh, I'm, I'm wrong about this and reflected on that, uh, those pieces have been very warmly received and have got plenty of attention. And I've seen a small number of, of other people do something similar. And generally, the people are quite relaxed about that. Um, so I don't think the pressure is on journalists to never admit they're wrong. I mean, maybe it seem, doesn't seem to be very strong. Um, I think there is a pressure on politicians to not admit they're wrong. Um, because well, why is it? It's partly that the easiest thing you can do is to somebody who's contradicted themselves, somebody who's changed their mind. You can say, well, they were definitely wrong once. Either they were wrong before or they're wrong now. We don't need to do any further policy analysis. Like they must have been wrong at some stage. It's quite a lazy attack, but you can do it. Um, and you know, we generally, a lot of people don't want to believe good things about politicians. I mean, with some, with some reason, um, but any politician, I mean, take Keir Starmer, half the country hates him because they're not Labour voters. Boris Johnson, half the country hates him because they're not Conservative voters. And then there are a lot of people who hate all politicians on principle. So we're not likely to cut people some slack when they stick their hands up and say, oh, yeah, I, was, I made a mistake about this. Um, how, can we, how can we make it easier? I mean, one tactic... One approach that I've suggested to politicians is when there's something they don't know about, uh, you know, say, here's something we're going to do for, we're going to help children catch up because of lockdown, and we're going to do the following things. Um, one possible approach is to say, we're going to do this and it's definitely going to work because we're brilliant. 
Another po possibility is to say, uh, we really want to help children catch up. Um, here are five things we're doing. We don't know which of them will work, but we're going to rigorously test them. And whichever of them do work, we'll do more of that. I think if you pre-announce that you're running experiments and pilots and you're going to find out and you'll follow the evidence uh, when it emerges, then it's you're completely fine when the evidence does emerge and you say, we're going to do this and we're going to stop doing this exactly like we said we would. That's fine. But you need to kind of preload it. And if you can push it down a level to the sort of technocratic level, like, oh, we've, we've hired some boffins and they're going to figure it out. I think that often helps. Um, we've seen some efforts to do that during the pandemic, not always successfully. But equally, I mean, this has been, what, like, if, if I ever got appointed that Dominic Cummings style position of power where you get to dictate the shape, shape of the nation, just massive, massive use of randomized control trials would be, um, uh, and it would, would be my, my sort of recipe, but. Um, yes, and I, I, I would agree with you with, with the one caveat that of course there, was, there are certain really important things that you can't run randomized trials to do. So you don't want to constrain yourself to, oh, we're only going to do stuff that we can do randomized trials over. But yeah, I agree. Randomized trials are great. They work far more broadly than most people think, and we should do a lot more of them. Um, question from uh, Councillor Dr. Ken Pollock. Um, uh, the BBC has a pronunciation unit. Should it have a statistics unit as well? Oh, it does have a statistics unit. Uh, Robert Cuff is the head of statistics at the BBC. He's very good, um, very smart, very clear communicator. Of course, if... You know, if somebody makes a mistake uh, on some prominent BBC programme, Robert's the one running around the building trying to fix all the news headlines and make sure all the journalists are properly briefed. Um, so, you know, they yeah, do. Also, and, I, I, should, yeah. I should declare an interest here. I went to Robert's wedding and kind of um, slightly take up that question. Yeah. So, but he's, yeah. So, so we do, but, it, you know, you can have a statistics unit. Uh, well, the pronunciation unit doesn't catch every mispronunciation and the statistics unit doesn't catch every statistical error, but we try. Um, and it, it's helpful to try to pin these down, these problems down quickly before they emerge. Uh, that's what Robert does. It's also what, for example, um, the full, full fact, the fact checks I mentioned before, what they try to do is, for example, if the Office for National Statistics keeps issuing press releases and every month the press release is misunderstood by journalists, for them to talk to the ONS and say, is there a way that you could rephrase your press release, given that people keep getting this wrong? How can we phrase it in a clearer way? I think you know, cutting, this stuff up, uh, cutting this stuff off at source, getting it right first time, is always better than having to fix your mistakes and clear up later. I mean, I'm all in favour of fixing your mistakes, but it's, it's better if you don't make them. Apologies for the howling in the background, but um, school's over. Um, uh, Vicky Price um, points out, it's like, it says, it's like, no one has time to check the data thrown us and personal experiences that can be used as filters vary. So are there lots of different truths one has to live with? And I, I just wanted to tag something onto that, which, is, which come, comes from one of your old appearances on the um, Colbert report, um, where, where he asked, you know, uh, you know, shouldn't shouldn't I just vote with you my, with my gut? And you said yes, you should vote with your gut because actually it's not going to really matter that much. Like you, one one individual vote in a non swing state is not going to really matter that much. So you might as well spend the energy working out what a high fight to get. <laughs> uh, yes, I I remember that. Uh, yes, that was quite an experience, Colbert. Um, what uh, I mean was we, I was specifically pointing out that. Uh, the, uh, the people rationally spend less effort thinking about how to vote than they spend on personal decisions like, I'm gonna buy a new car, I'm gonna buy a new camera, a new, new phone. Um, they put a lot more effort into that um, because it actually affects their lives. Whereas our votes affect our lives collectively, but our individual votes do not. So, so, um, so, yeah. so, so Nikki's question, what are the things that we should really care about? Um, so, you know, and and what, what are the ones we should let slide? So one heuristic that I have is, if I was boiling the, the, the advice in the book down to, uh, to three little rules, it would be the three Cs, a calm, context, curiosity. So notice your emotional reaction, don't evaluate statistics when you're feeling upset or angry or vindicated or joyful or in denial or any of these things. Notice your emotional reaction, take a second to be calm, then get the context, what's being measured, is it going up or is it going down? Is it a big number? Is it a small number? Where did it come from? Fairly simple questions. And then curiosity, which is, what does this number teach me about the world? Rather than, how can I next deploy this number to win some argument? Um, so those are the three Cs. 
Vicky's right. Even for someone who's kind of engaged and interested, you don't have time even for, the, for that very, very simple checklist. You don't have time to do that for every number. But what I think we do have time to do is to say, well, is the source that I'm getting this number from, are they respecting the three Cs? So if I, if I read a claim in a, in a Robert Colville column, is he helping me be calm? Is he giving me the context? And is he, uh, is he using these numbers in a way that provokes my curiosity and helps me understand the world? Or is he just sort of um, not giving me the details, uh, giving me a very particular take and trying to push a particular line of argument very hard? Or, um, and of course you would never do that. So you would pass that test. You'd always give us a calm <laughs> curiosity context um, or some, you know, those things that go around on Facebook and, and it's just text, but it's not even text. It's just a graphics image. So it's a, terrible for people who are visually impaired. And, you know, people just sharing the image because it looks, it looks striking. There's no context. There's no idea of the source. There's no, the, there's no effort to calm you. It's trying to engage you. It's trying to enrage you. Um, and it's just trying to make some cheap point. So even if we don't have time to go for calm, context and curiosity ourselves, we can very quickly tell whether that is the kind of message we're getting from the journalist, from the social media post or not. Or although there's a wonderful vignette in your book that, um, that in your wife's case, she just asks you because she thinks that you have a, a repository of every, every statistic in your head because that's your job, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a safe approach. Um, it, we, just just one last question we've got time for, and really sorry to everyone who, who we couldn't get to, um, but um, just a really interesting question from um, um, an anonymous attendee, um, that the bath stat was so eye-catching because it ran counter to the, the fearful messages that were, were being then kind of going around. Do you have to be careful about when to share a statistic, even if it's true and correct? I mean, is openness always the best policy or, or, or I mean, I, reading your book, I, I sense you'll come down on the, the, the side of uh, let sunlight win, win the day on, the, on this. Yeah. So, I mean, so what one could have a statistic that is uh, true, but so damaging that it could never be, could never be uttered because it would be so, um, what would be an example? Statistic that, say, that X percent of crimes were committed by people from a particular Ethnic, you know, ethnic group, or some, some, something that was was likely to kind of stir up. I, I don't know. Yeah. Or, or so one could have a one could discover that actually um, the mortality rate of the of the vaccine was much higher than we thought, and uh, uh, you know maybe uh, maybe it kills one in a million people. And so if you're going to vaccinate the whole country, 60, pe 60 people are going to die. Uh, in that vaccination pro process, and should you should you share that? Uh, by the way, no reason to believe this is true. By the way, but you know, and, if that and, was true, and, and like 10, 10, you know, ten thousand people a day are dying of, of COVID, so it would have to be a pretty well. That, yes, so that was the thing because across if, across Europe, that is sorry, not in, not in the UK. Obviously. But if that was if, if it was if it was true that a, a vaccine had a one in a million death rate, which is I mean, the, I'm pretty sure there have been vaccines with with that higher death rate in the past. Um, you'd still want people to take the vaccine because the risk of COVID is so much higher. Um, so should you suppress that fact? Um, my instinct is, is not. So the last episode of How to Vaccinate the World, we had a, a very full discussion of what we know about these, these rare blood clots that have been associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And is it really happening? Is it not really happening? We weren't interested in, in burying that. Um, so my, my suspicion is that I would always say it's better to be able to discuss these things openly and evaluate them. If they're true, these are truths that can be known. Um, possibly you can think of a counterexample that I can't think of, but that's, that would be my instinct. Um, I'm afraid we're, we're just out of time, but Tim, thank you very much for a really fascinating talk and thank you all for watching. Um, so A, please buy Tim's books, uh, it, especially How to Make the World Add Up, but um, the, the back catalogue is, is there and it will, 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 will pay you. Really. Yeah, there you go, there's the book. Um, 
Uh, please also follow CPS on Twitter and Facebook um, and subscribe to our newsletter if you want to get uh, invitations to more things like this. Um, if you, uh, the recording of this will be available on YouTube if anyone, if anyone wants to go back and, and look at it. But um, uh, please sort of don't really, but in your privacy of your own homes, join me in, uh, in thanking Tim Harford very, very much. And I hope you all have a very pleasant lockdown anniversary and a rather more pleasant few months to come. <laughs>